Hi, I'm Matt Weeks, and this is Internal Affairs, Hacking File System Access from the Web. I am Deloitte & Touche's Technology Fellow. Deloitte & Touche is the Deloitte member firm that does risk advisory in the U.S. Prior to that, as a little bit of introduction, I led R9B's research and development group, focusing on things like reverse engineering, vulnerability discovery and exploit development, developing capabilities for red teaming, as well as detection and response. For this presentation, I'm going to be talking about what is the file system access API, how is it used, why is it implemented, where can you use it now, what things does it do, and talk about different attacks that an attacker might be able to conduct with it, some that failed and some that succeeded. So first, there's a little bit of background. What is the file system access API? So the file system access API is the latest in a long train of APIs, capabilities which have been added to web technologies to make web pages more feature comparable with native desktop or mobile applications. So some of those which have been added in prior years have been things like access to webcams and microphones provided to the JavaScript running within a web page. And obviously that's very useful for everybody who's remote, wants to hop onto a video conference and not have to install a program and ha have that function from any platform that they're running on, right? And so many, many different programs have become through these APIs have become possible to then implement. We now have the ability to run background threads with web workers. We now have the ability to save things in the client without sending them to the server with things like session storage, things like that. But for certain, certain types of programs, you really need to be able to access files or folders in order to make those work, in order to be able to integrate well with programs that might be running on your desktop. So, you can think of things like image editors. I want to be able to apply filters and, and then save that image all within the same application, web application, and not have to pop a save file dialog every time that I make a change there. Or you can think of games which have a lot of supporting files, not all of which are wanting to be in memory at the same time. Or database related software, which is accessing files too big for memory, music players that want to play your music collection and not just whatever they can stream from the internet using a bunch of network bandwidth. So lots of, lots of different use cases for this and has the potential for a, a lot of things on the user side of, of the equation. But of course, it also has a lot of potential on the malicious or exploitation side of things. When was it introduced? Well, basically this became available to mainstream browsers all within the past year. It was basically late 2020 that it was implemented under the native file system API name that was changed with kind of a re-release earlier this year, calling it the file system access API. And this API is a potential for standardization. The intention is that this is not a particular feature to one specific browser. It's something that most should be able to support in the near future. And many of them already do. So let's talk about what functionality it has in detail. So the API has a number of different functions that you can call which request access from the user to either open or write a file and open and then potentially write to a directory. And we'll do a demo of that shortly. There are a lot of secure features implemented here because of course there's a lot of potential for malicious activity. So first of all, every file that that page writes will get the mark of the web on Windows, which will trigger smart screen, antivirus filtering, whitelisting, things like that. This presentation will be a little bit focused on Windows because that's the most popular desktop OS still. Now, some interesting things are that you cannot specify full paths or even file separators if you want to access subdirectories of a directory that you have access to. And one of the reasons behind this is that you can't, you know, different OSs interpret different slashes as going as, as having different interpretations. And so all that is, is wiped out. You have to access each individual file or sub entry to a directory as its separate API call. So you can't uh, put together those paths. There's blocked file types. There's certain things that you can't write because they're just too dangerous. And there's also limitations of arbitrary read, read and write. So although the API exposed an interface which seems to imply you can open a file, seek to a location within it, read and write, in reality, when you're editing a file, you're editing a temporary file, which is added with a .crswap 
extension, that temporary file, then once you close the file, is then swapped over the original file. And so you're not actually editing a file live. And so that does limit some of the uh, potentials. You also uh, don't have the ability of doing things like attribute modification. You can't make things executable on Linuxes or change ACLs or edit extended attributes on Windows, things like that. So let's talk about threat models. What does an attacker maybe want to do or a defender want to prevent? First of all is unintended reads. Obviously, you don't want sensitive data exposed to the internet that you, you didn't really intend to share. Unintended writes would be even worse. You might be able to corrupt files or cause a denial of service conditions on your disk. And though most severe, of course, would be code execution where you'd be able to do all of the previous as well as persistent access and even access to, um, to be able to encrypt your drive or ransomware or things like that. So first of all, what are the attacks that I tried that failed? One of them was alternate data stream modifications. I was wanted to see if I could remove the mark of the web by removing the alternate data stream that it is stored in. That was blocked. No ADSs are able to be modified from this interface. Directory traversal. Also, all kinds of path shenanigans were blocked. I couldn't open up the parent directory with a dot dot. So I had no luck there. I was wondering if maybe you could convince a user to open and share writable access to, say, their startup folder or other profile folders in which by writing a file, they will be automatically executed next time the user logs in. Also blocked. Even parent folders of that, um, there's, there's many different locations which are simply disabled because they're too sensitive, so you can't share those with this API. Also shortcut-based attacks. I want to see if I could drop a link file and trigger a remote uh, DLL load or at least an NTLM authentication that would allow me to crack a password. Those are blocked by type. LNK files can't be written. Um, and high-level folder access. I want to see if I could share the drive root that also did not work, was, was blocked. So you see a lot of thought has been paid to many different attacks by blocking all of these. Nevertheless, I think there's still potential for abuse. So the first thing I want to show is um, a low severity issue. It's basically a demo of intended functionality that I think still has some risk to an ordinary user. So let's see what that looks like. So if I am um, opening a browser, I go to a website. In this case, it's a local host, but it could be a remote uh, drive. Script Junkie Social Network. Oh, great. I want to join that. I want to upload a profile picture. Now, before I go to the actual upload, I'm showing in Windows Explorer what this picture is and where it is. See, in my pictures folder, and I could have put it in the root of the pictures folder. It's the same difference. I made a subfolder called Save Pictures. Here you can see that picture of uh, me with the headshot. That's what I want to share. Um, but what I don't want to share is, of course, embarrassing pictures from the internet, which I may have downloaded. Embarrassing pictures of me, which would be even worse, or extremely cringeworthy memes. So, I click on the button in the website to upload that profile picture. It pops up this file chooser dialog. It looks just like a normal upload dialog with slight differences. It says select folder instead. So I'm going to click on that save pictures folder that I know my file is in. Now normally I would be able to click that open button, which now says select folder and it would just open that up, and then I would be able to select the file and click open to, to upload it. In this case, because it's a folder selection, instead it pops up this dialog here. So this is where all the security is. It has a prompt that requests the user decide whether or not to grant access to files in this folder, saved pictures. If the user absentmindedly clicks it and doesn't realize what they're doing, or they intentionally click it, this is what happens. Immediately, the website is able to view not only the picture of me, information about it, and get the actual contents of it, but also recursively enumerate all of the subfolders in that folder, including embarrassing pictures from the internet, embarrassing pictures of me, which could be blackmailable, and worst of all, extremely cringeworthy memes, because we don't want the internet to see what type of things I laugh at. So, um, that's just a quick example of what an exfiltration demo looks like. Now, that could be accelerated very quickly because, again, you, you can uh, resize pictures, you can draw them onto canvases at host speed. All this code is running natively on the client system, so you can use the APIs in the browser to generate small versions of those pictures and send them out very quickly over the internet. Basically, as fast as your hard drive can, can pop these pictures out, you would be able to send them out to and the web and, um, and potentially do bad things with them, right? So it's very fast. Um, in this case, we showed it in the 
web browser, but of course you can do that silently so that nobody would see anything beyond that. So something to be worried about, but again, this is intended functionality. This is just a consequence of what file access might be. Let's talk about some more significant issues. Denial of service, first of all, in file temporary creation, I mentioned earlier that when you're editing a file, it creates a CR swap file to hold temporary edits to that file. Well, if you have multiple handles open, writable files to that same path, it will create multiple CR swap files, and those will be numbered. And if you're creating those, and there is a, in, in certain situations, when you are creating multiple handles while a promise hasn't resolved yet, it can enter an infinite loop. It's just a simple bug that will create as many CR swap files as it can, which it goes up to 99 because they're two-digit numbers, and then it just fails out. Again, this is this is a minor issue. It's just a small bug that would just enter that would just cause an issue with that particular website or that particular file, that particular folder. Again, you're just creating junk in the, in the folder. And this is essentially just a consequence of, hey, if you grant rival access to a folder, then, then that's a risk that you take. But it is worth pointing out that the risk of things like just writing a ton of files and creating a ton of disk usage is a little bit more severe with this API than with other browser interactions which would require downloading something from the internet or storing a file in memory that you can download. In this case, you can keep writing more bytes as quickly as you can without requiring a ton of memory bandwidth and without waiting for network traffic. So you can fill up the drive very, very quickly, as fast as the hard drive can write, basically, and potentially cause denial of service attacks on the host. But again, this is just a risk. You can consume disk access if you grant disk access to a website. So worth thinking about, but not severe. So now let's talk about some of the more significant attacks. Remote code execution attacks, the first one is going to be binary planting. So binary planting is a technique which has been useful in a lot of exploits going back uh, more than 10 years. A lot of applications will load various libraries, usually DLLs on Windows. Um, and if it's loading a non-standard DLL, part of the search path will be the current working directory. And if that DLL isn't there, um, isn't in one of the higher level search paths, then that program will try to load that from the current directory. So if you can write a DLL to that directory, it will then get loaded by that program and get executed. There are also other binary planting vulnerabilities involving things like writing uh, EXEs or script names which could get executed, but this is the most common. And this one is a, a significant attack vector because, surprisingly, DLLs are not on the excluded list. So. Let's do a quick demo of what this attack looks like, how to get code execution through the file access API. So in this case, we're going to go to a new website. This one's going to be an audio editor. So the audio editor, Script Junkies Music Studio, um, requests access to a project folder. Now we've seen some previous attacks here. We're not gonna, we're not gonna grant it access to anything. We're gonna create a new folder, completely empty folder, just call it test, select that folder. So we have the same prompt again, asking for access, readable access to that folder. Now you see the page requests writable access to the folder, and here's the prompt that comes up there. It asks to be able to edit files in test until you close all tabs for this site. Okay, simple enough, no problem. Again, this is a completely empty folder that we just granted access to. So we will click the Save Changes button, and this um, web app then will we'll spend time editing our music, saving our stuff, and we'll create a project file in that folder. Now suppose we want to edit that with a different program. So I'm going to open up Windows Explorer. I could have closed the website. Nothing, the website's not doing anything at this point. I'm going to go to that folder, and I'm going to double click the Audacity project. Double click that file, loads up the desktop program, which also edits that project file, and boom, you have been hacked. Pops up a calculator. It's never good when you get a message box saying you have been hacked. So code execution, we've got calc running, all because that website was able to write a DLL to the same folder as that project file, which then got opened in a program which loads up a DLL. And that's just one example. Like I said, there, there are lots of other programs which have the same issue. So that's, I think, a, a significant risk to this API granting writable access. To, to folders, especially because you can write DLLs to those folders and, and those might get loaded. And that load happens regardless. You notice there was no mark of the web that, um, that you ran into there. It just simply 
load it immediately because load library doesn't check mark the web or give you any kind of smart screen prompts. Are you sure you want to run this before opening up? All right, so next uh, remote code execution attack um, is one that I call slate of hand. So in this one, I'm going to do a quick demonstration before we actually get started and um, do the, and, and explain it. So here's the video. So in this instance, the scenario is you're going to a website and this website is going to provide you with some test scripts. You've got some issue with your network connectivity and you want to see, hey, is everything working right? And this happens a lot for people in the technology industry. How many times have we downloaded some tool off the internet? I mean, every, every icon on the desktop, right, is something that we've downloaded on the internet, from the internet and run. Um, and when we're downloading scripts from, you know, people in, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe some Stack Overflow clone or something like that, uh, and you're not sure who's, who's saved this or who's shared this, this is a potential risk, right? So here it's asking me to save this script. So I'm going to save it. It's a batch script. I'm just going to call it test. Um, but I don't know if this is safe or not. I want to see if this script will, will cause me any issues, will be you know, malicious at all. So I want to inspect this script before I run it. So ask yourself, if you're downloading a file to, you know, a script to help you out with something, how would you verify whether or not there is something malicious in this script if you're not sure where you got it from? Well, first thing I would do is look at it. So I'm going to go to edit. Not going to run it. I'm just going to edit it in Notepad. Now, because this is a downloaded file, I will get the smart screen prompt, but again, I'm just editing it. So what does it say? Ping 127001. It's just pinging localhost. Very simple, clearly nothing malicious in here. Now, I know you might be thinking, oh, well, maybe he's used some Unicode trick to hide some malicious stuff in the script. There is no Unicode trick, so straight up notepad, but just to show you that, I'm gonna open it with the hex editor. This is every byte in the file. You can see it right here. It is ping 127.0.0.1 and a new line character. There's absolutely nothing else in the file. Here's the binary. If you wanted, you could upload this to a antivirus scanner, you could run it with a virus scanner locally, you could you know, run on one of the services that will run against a million virus scanners, um, and you could test it out and it'll come back clean. So now I'm gonna run it. Okay, it's pinging localhost and popping calc. So just like that, we get command execution of arbitrary commands, um, all with this technique that completely bypassed all of, the all of the normal techniques that you would use to look at a file and decide whether or not it's malicious or benign. And I think that's, that's probably one of the more severe attacks that you can do. So let's talk about how that worked. In a normal download flow, you'll open a site, you'll click a script to, or click a link to download a script that will then redirect you to a save prompt for a file with a name You'll save that. After that download completes, you'll examine that file. Smart screen might run its checks at that point, and then you run the file. In this attack, using the new file system API access, instead of providing a link to a file which is a direct download, what you do is you provide a link to a Java, bit of JavaScript which requests writable access. And it, we, can, we can force the file extension to be what we want it to be, which in this case was a batch file. So you'll get the save prompt, you'll have to type the name, and then it will write that file. At that point, the user will examine the file, smart screen will check for what's running on that file, or you know, the contents of that file, and then when you double click that, that file will be written. But here's the difference. The difference is by using the file access API, the web page retains write access to that file, even after you have now run it in something else. So the user will run that file, and the page can then re-request edit access to that file, get edit access to the file. The browser will attempt to lock the file, but when running scripts like batch scripts, the command prompt doesn't hold the lock to the file. And so it will then be able to edit that file as it is being executed, add additional commands to it to do whatever you want, and then close it. At that point, because the file is already running in command prompt, it has already run the smart screen checks. It has already sent those hashes to Microsoft to be viewed, and there will be no further prompt. It will simply run those malicious um, instructions that you have added to the file, the malicious commands, and you've basically got, um, got no ability to, to then see what it is or, or an opportunity to examine it because, like I said, it can, 
And depending on what the script is, you could potentially detect that it's been run and then only apply the edit once you know it is in progress of execution. So in, in a normal download flow, what are some of the differences here? Well, the site can only suggest the extension and the website only has write access once. The essential difference is in the attack with file system access API, the site, first of all, can force the extension, which isn't a major issue, um, but most of all, it can re-access that file. And again, like we've explained before, it does require a whole file lock and replacement. However, when command prompt is executing a batch script, it opens the file, reads the first line, closes the file, executes the line, then reopens the file, seeks to the next spot in the, in the file, reads some more, and then executes that. So with uh, script-like execution with these type of script interpreters, you really don't have an issue with um, locking that file because the, the lock is not held by the interpreter as it's being executed. So even though the website has a brief lock to edit it, that doesn't conflict with the script execution, which is running it, which then reobtains a lock when it then wants to run the next command, and it has no issue executing the newly added malicious instructions. Now, this is not uh, vulnerable. It doesn't apply to execution types that maintain handles during execution, like an, e like an EXE. I can't edit an EXE while it's running because that lock will conflict. However, it works fine with this script, and I assume others, but this was the first I tried. So next, let's talk about forensic artifacts of these attacks. So first of all, you have obviously browser cache and other forensics for these attacks that you might be able to see. For the slate of hand, one of the biggest things that you're looking for if you're doing a forensic analysis and you're suspecting something like this happens is looking at the timestamps. Because in this case, you won't have a single file edit. You will have had a series of edits. So you'll see both, and, and because the temporary file is used, you may also see remnants of that temporary file. So that file which is in use, the modification times again will be later than the creation times, and that will give you a hint that maybe this was modified after it was originally created for that slate of hand attack. You also may see some of those temporary file entries like the CR swap entries, which will tell you that, hey, this thing uh, came from the file system access API, and it didn't come from a normal download. Um, and, and those temporary file entries might still exist in the MFT. Obviously, they can be uh, overwritten by other files later, but you may see that if you, if you get a forensic image quickly. Um, other, other things are for the DLL attack. You may have evidence of DLL load, depending on, you know, if you have settings on things like uh, Sysmon or EDRs, might be able to see that DLL being written and loaded, even though it maintains the mark of the web the whole time for the binary planting attack. And obviously you, help, you also have any, any of the host files, like in our example was the audio project file, which was written, you might be able to see things like that. So um, these, are, these are the main forensics artifacts that you're looking for from a DFIR perspective. Let's talk about how to mitigate this from a, a perspective of both the user as well as potentially the browser maker. So first of all, as a user, the biggest thing to do is to understand what exactly the new permissions provide and, and look for certain signs that a website is using some of these new permissions instead of the old file download method. So one of those would be the fact that if you're, if you're doing a file write with the file access API, it will ask you to prompt, and it's a single file write, not a folder access write, as opposed to a download, it will prompt you to fill in the full name of the file. And it also won't allow you to edit your extension. So you could look for those two signs to say, you know, make that, make that stick in your mind. Hey, after I save this, this web page will continue to have right access to it until I close the web page in all of its windows. Um, other, other actions to avoid are things like uh, downloading without uh, double checking what's in that file uh, before before running it, or like we've seen how that can be bypassed, especially before closing the tabs. That's the biggest takeaway here is that once you close that tab, that web page no longer has access to those files and, and can't mess with things. So what you want to do is you want to be able to do that first before messing with any of the files that a page has written. And also be careful about uh, running any programs which may have uh, DLL preloading vulnerabilities or, or issues. So I don't know that I would necessarily say that was 
for sure a vulnerability. I know a lot of those are called that. The authors of that software might just say, hey, if you're opening a project, you have to trust the directory that it's in. It's one of those situations where you know the browser maker can say, no, it's your fault for loading DLLs from random directories. And the program maker can say, no, it's your fault, browser, for allowing the website to write a DLL to a random directory. I'm not taking a side on who's right. I'm just saying, from the perspective of a user, maybe, maybe you should be warned about that and look for any of those which have been in folders which you've granted a website access to write to. Having said that, at the browser level, if the browser did want to stop it, they could block access to writing DLLs, just like they've blocked access to writing link files. Some other things that they could do are uh, blocking script files, like batches from being executed. That would also stop the um, swapping attack there. It could also lock the file for the entire duration of potential access. So it doesn't release a lock and then allow you to regain that file lock and edit it again. Another thing it could do would be adding a user approval prompt for uh, read-write access. Like we had, instead of that file download looking essentially the same as a normal file download, that file write access would have a different prompt like that blue button we saw earlier. That's something that could be done. Or it could prompt again if you re-request access. Maybe it doesn't prompt the first time you request access. Another thing they could do is a visual indication for ongoing access. So we've all seen this if you've used a web page which requests access to your video or microphone, there will be a recording indicator visible that shows, hey, this website still has some sensitive access to your system. Something like that could be done for the file access that we've seen, and maybe that would be another hint that would, that would help out the user. So that's another option that browser makers might be able to do. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and leave a few minutes for, <clears throat> for any questions.